Welcome everyone in the name of Jesus. I'm Mark Schuler from St. Paul, sort of filling in here as we look forward to hopefully the soon arrival of a new pastor, although I, those of you on the search committee, I'm sure it feels like it's taking forever, right? See a couple smiles over there from Crystal, yeah. It is that way. And yet um, our God is with us. And what's interesting to me in this time is how so many of the lessons on Sunday morning because we're following the opening up of Jesus' public ministry, how those lessons speak so specifically to our transitional situation. And we'll hear more about that today through three little scenes from Mark's Gospel as Jesus and his followers are sort of figuring out how it is to do ministry in their particular time and circumstance, even as we are challenged to do that here. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we're real happy that you're here, and it's also wonderful to, to see those of you who've been able to get back here uh, after a little bit. It's actually just wonderful uh, to see people back as we gather together for worship today. I invite you to stand as you're able for the opening. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call on him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from this sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. O oh, Almighty God,
God be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. Do you believe that the forgiveness I speak is not my forgiveness, but God's? Let it be done for you as you believe. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, keep your family and the church continually in your true faith, that the divine and the hope of your heavenly grace we may ever be defended by your mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. first reading for today is taken from Isaiah chapter 40, starting at the 21st verse. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princesses to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, said the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is dis disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faith, and to him he has no might. He increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall, exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel reading from Mark chapter 1, starting at the 29th verse. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by the demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and the those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the gospel of the Lord.
Good morning. How are you guys today? Good. I brought something with me today. Does anyone know what this is? Yes. It's a little laptop computer, right? Now, what can I all do on this? Homework. Yep, you guys can do some homework on there. It's, you can play some games. Yes, you can search up a map. Absolutely. Now, some of us adults out here, we do a lot of work on computers, okay? And so if I, say, worked on this all day long, I was doing some searching and typing and I worked on it the next day and the next day. <clears throat> What's going to eventually happen with this computer? Corbin? Well, close. It's going to run out of a battery. Because does this have a power source? Is it connected to anything? No. So how do we recharge this? Electricity. So would we need like a cord that would specifically fit just into this computer, right? And there's lots of different cords that people can have. So somebody might have another computer, but this cord might not work for them. Just this cord works for this computer. Are there other things that you guys can think of that needs to be like recharged? Corbin? What's that? Ooh, you're getting ahead of the game. He said human body. Yes. Audra, can you think of something? Our phones, yeah? You can use your phones, but eventually, at some point, it's going to be zero, and you're not going to be able to do any work. Yes. Remote control monster truck. Yeah, that's a good one. Do you have one? Teslas? You guys are really doing good here. I'm kind of impressed with these answers. You're right. And one thing I wanted to come back to is Corbin said the human body. So where do we plug this into in our human body? We don't have something like this to charge to get recharged to, right? But guess what? We do need to get recharged. And we're going to go back to one of our readings today that Lise went over, and it was Mark 1, 29 through 39. So here's the deal. I need you guys' help, okay? Because Jesus, when he lived on the earth, he had to recharge too. So he couldn't just go and go and go and go and go. It didn't work for him either. And guess what? It doesn't work for us. So as I, I condense this story, and as I read this story, I want you guys to use your hands to kind of be the battery charge. Okay? So if we think his battery's high, then our hands need to be up in the air. But then if we think like, oh, he's doing a lot of work, his energy, his battery's probably getting low, then we're going to go down to the ground. Think you guys can do that for me? All right, get those arms loosened up. Jesus traveled all around Galilee, preaching, driving out demons, and healing people. So he probably started out the day with lots of, en with lots of energy, right? But he was doing lots and lots and lots of work. So what do you think probably happened with his, at his battery level? Probably went down a little bit. You're right. One day, Jesus and some of his disciples went to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was there in bed with a fever. Jesus took her by hand and helped her up. All at once, the fever left her, and she began to prepare a meal for everyone. So probably went down a little bit more because he helped somebody else, right? That evening, many people came to Jesus to be healed of all sorts of diseases. Many people. <gasps> I bet his battery went down. He helped a lot of people that day, didn't he? The whole town gathered to watch. That must have been a really, really long day. So guess what? Jesus went to sleep. What's going to happen if he goes to sleep? He's going to get a little bit more recharged, right? Now, the next morning, he found a quiet place to pray and to recharge his spirit. What do you think happened to his battery? Whoop! It went way up. Absolutely. Now, when Simon and the others woke him up, they found him and they said, everyone is looking for you. So Jesus had already recharged his batteries. So guess what? He was ready to go. He said to them, let's go to the other towns and villages so that I get to preach to them too. 
That's what I came to do. So they traveled throughout the region of Galilee. Oh, I bet that battery's gonna go down a little bit. Put the battery down. I lost my spot. Throughout the region of Galilee, and Jesus preached in the synagogues and healed even more people and cast out more demons. How do you think his energy is going to be then? A little bit down. But guess what he probably did that next night to recharge? Anyone have an idea? He probably got rest and went to pray to be with his father, God, right? What do you think we could take from this lesson? So if Jesus needed to recharge and he went to God the Father, who does that mean we should probably be going to? God, right? What are some ways that we can recharge? I'm thinking we're doing one of them right now. Eating, yep, that's going to charge our body nutritionally, right, for physically wise, yes? Eating and sleeping. And to recharge our spirit spiritual body we need to come to church and we need to spend time in prayer and reading our bible right and all of those things are gonna what is that going to do to our battery the more we pray spend time with god go to sunday school worship do you think our battery is going to get drained or do you think that's going to fill up our battery it's going to fill up our battery. So when sometimes during our week, if our battery feels like it's getting a little low, because that happens to all of us, we want to make sure we turn to the true person that's going to fill our battery, and that's going to be God. Sound good? All right, I want you guys to bring it in. And then congregation, you guys can help repeat after me with this prayer. All right, ready, Audra? Can you put your arm in? Dear Jesus. Help us, to remember Help us to remember that we can always come to you, come to, you. To, recharge to recharge our spiritual batteries through prayer, through prayer. Sunday, school, Sunday school, Bible stool, Bible school. And, going to and going to church. In Jesus' name.
The text is the gospel lesson just read. In the name of Jesus. Over the last several Sundays during this season after Epiphany, we have been hearing stories from the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. How he called and created around him a community of close followers to participate in his ministry, and then how he went into synagogues proclaiming the reign of God and demonstrating the power of that reign with little glimpses as in the casting out of a demon, for example. All of these are pointing, though, to greater things than these that will occur when Jesus goes to the cross, and then ultimately when God sets all things right in the new creation. This Sunday, our gospel lesson takes us inside Jesus' public ministry a bit with three scenes. We sort of get at the inner workings of how Jesus went about his task of proclaiming God's kingdom and announcing the new thing God is about to do. And I suggest that these scenes have implications for us at this very time in our church's life, when we're in transition, getting ready for what God will do next among us. And it also has something to say to us as individuals as we participate in God's missional work on behalf of Jesus, all pointing to the greater things that God has in store. So part one, the inner workings of Jesus' ministry in three scenes. The first involves Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus went to the house of Simon and Andrew and was told about Peter's mother-in-law who was sick with a fever. Luke tells us it was a great fever, so we're probably talking about malaria, which in antiquity was a death sentence. But Jesus took her by the hand, lifted her up, and wonder of wonders, the fever left her, and she began to serve them. Notice, Jesus is here attending to the group that is following him closely. This is not something out in public. This is something private. And her beginning to serve them hints at what will become a reality very quickly that part of the way Jesus and his disciples were able to go about their ministry was that they were receiving support from a group of Galilean women. And that would continue all the way to Jerusalem. In the second uh, scene, night has fallen. And evening is the worst time for illness. It's a time of darkness, so it's not hard to understand how the demonic might be at work as well. The sick and demon-possessed are brought to Jesus. The whole city is gathering around the door. He cured many. He cast out many. He silenced the demons because they knew him. Now, these wonderful deeds of Jesus, as we've talked about previously, are signs of what God will eventually do when there is no more sorrow, sickness, pain, or death. But did the people realize that this was a sign of that? Did they come because they understood? Or did did they come because they were amazed? Or in desperate need? Or curious? That you sort of get a sense from this part of the story that the battery was getting low, to quote from the children's message. Jesus is almost overwhelmed by what's going on. And there's no proclamation of God's coming reign, no direct connection between what Jesus is doing and what will be someday, no mention of what must take place first in Jerusalem to defeat the powers of Satan. It's a bit of a frightening story. And then, scene three, in the morning, Jesus leaves before sunrise and goes to a deserted place, the place of the supernatural, the place where prophets went to find God, the place where demons lurked. And there he prayed. Now, 
Stories of Jesus praying are rare. In Mark's gospel, only two other times does Mark record Jesus praying, after the feeding of the 5,000 and at Gethsemane. So this, in Mark's view, is a significant moment, perhaps a divine consultation. What was Jesus to do in view of what was happening? The crowds are coming, but are they coming for the right reason? And then Simon and those with him show up, and they confront him. The language in Greek is they hunted him down. All these people are seeking you, Peter says, as if to say, what are you doing here? They need you back there. Go and continue to do what you were doing. But Jesus says, let's go elsewhere to the neighboring towns. And you get a little bit of a sense of the trying to figure out this ministry thing in the first followers. But Jesus provides rationale. I go so that I might proclaim there. A sort of recalibration. Less focus on the miraculous, more on the proclamation. And Mark's gospel is always pushing us beyond the mighty deeds to that great deed in Jerusalem and to the coming of God's promised kingdom. For this is why he, I have come, Jesus said. Despite the needs of people for physical healing, though that healing is just for this life. The ministry of Jesus is about eternal things as well. The text ends, sorry, I forgot to advance the slide. The text ends with a description of the ongoing ministry. He went to villages throughout Galilee, doing the very thing he did at the beginning, entering, in their t entering into their synagogues, proclaiming the reign of God, and doing mighty deeds. Implications for us as we go forward. The healing of Peter's mother-in-law. Caring for those in the community is an important part of the work of the church in view of their needs and because of their role. Sometimes, unfortunately, the church focuses too much on internal needs and the mission suffers. But mission-focused fo congregations must also keep in mind that those who help make the mission possible. And as, a, as you seek a new pastor, this is a good time to have some of those conversations about balance in what you do. And I even see a bit of that calibration going on with the emergence of a, a new group among us, the, the day brighteners who can be visiting homebound members. So figuring out the balance of ministry is a constant process, and it's good to be engaged in that, especially at a time of transition. The night healing of Jesus reminds the church, reminds us of the critical need, of uh, the critical work of addressing the physical needs of those outside the church. And those needs are many. And this is an area where this congregation really shines from blessed to be blessing to so many things that you are involved in. I'm just amazed. But even Jesus at times could struggle a bit in trying to provide all the help that was asked of him and how to connect that to his larger purpose and ministry. So it is important for us as well to be in conversation with each other about how what we do for others can open the door and foster what we're really all about, which is the spread of the gospel. If Jesus could be overwhelmed, that's a bit of caution for us as well. We best serve God's mission when we are alert and focused on how our efforts might open the door for gospel proclamation. And a transition is a good time for a congregation to be conversing about these matters. In the third scene, Jesus 
goes to pray. And that Jesus chose to withdraw and pray is an important reminder to us of the need that we do that also. So you'll hear later today in the announcements about a, a new prayer focus for the, for the congregation, Pray Local, on Wednesdays at 7 p.m., part of the efforts to do exactly what Jesus did in this text. And there's an email chain as well that will be part of it. Adding to the prayers we do on Sunday, it is critical at a time of transition such as ours to take this example of Jesus and run with it. And the need for prayer is illustrated also by that not so comfortable exchange between Jesus and Peter. What shall we do as we go forward? What new directions might we take on? It is in a time of prayer that we are most open to what God would have us do. And we have the promise. In the end of our first lesson, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings of, of like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be faint. Prayer, refocusing, recalling the mission, remembering what Jesus came to do. These are all part of our opportunity during this time of transition. But there are also implications for us as individuals in the church. The healing of Peter's mother-in-law. If caring for members of our community is part of our task, then each of us in the community are called on to be attentive to care for self as well. Even as Peter's mother-in-law could be about her tasks again when Jesus raised her up, each of us, as we care for ourselves, are better able to be involved in the mission activities of the church. Now, self-care has a, a physical side, lifestyle, exercise, all those things that make for one's tank to be full physically. But self-care has an important spiritual side engaging in prayer, being in God's word, receiving the sacrament that we share today, gathering with God's people. The night healings also speak to individuals involved in the mission. Our mission is about saving souls, but the needs of the body can be so overwhelming. James writes, if a brother or sister is fully clothed, or is poorly clothed, or lacking daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, without giving them the th things needed for the body, what good is that? Care for the physical needs of others is part of what we do so that we can share the gospel with them. It's a way of showing the love of Jesus, and it's essential to the mission of each and every Christian but it can overwhelm. The poor you will always have with you, Jesus says. The story of the night healings is a call to help others, but within the context of the larger mission. If all you find yourself doing is addressing the physical needs of others, the mission has greater things than these in which you may engage. And then there is prayer this final scene. It really is an invitation to pray, an invitation to consider, again, the focus of your personal involvement in missional work. It's an invitation to recall what Jesus came to do, an invitation to follow him to the neighboring towns to proclaim the message there also. This transition in the life of the church will we'll bring about new things for each of you. A new pastor will arrive to lead. That arrival will raise new opportunities as the mission of this congregation moves to its next phase. What a wonderful time to respond, here am I, send me. 
And Isaiah's promise to the community rests on each of you as well. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Today's gospel lesson has taken us inside the ministry of Jesus as it moves to a new stage. We, in this place, are also in a time of transition. And a consideration of this text presents to us possibilities, greater things than these, that may indeed be in store for us. So what are the takeaways? From the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, we learn that care for the community and self is part of our work together. From the night healings, we learn that addressing physical needs of others not only helps them with their daily life, but is an important opening for the gospel. And the time of prayer is a reminder that prayer does open the door to the direction that God would have us go in Jesus. So, let us go forth knowing that greater things than these God has in store for us, in the name of Jesus. Amen. As you are able, I invite you to stand. We'll speak together the Nicene Creed. <coughs> Continue to receive prayers and off prayers and tithe. I'm off here. <laughs> Start over. We continue to receive your tithes and offerings at the door or via online means. Uh, thank you for your support of the mission in this place. Also, kindly remember to fill out one of the welcome cards and give it to the usher as you leave today. Called to know, love, and follow God. We pray for the church, the world, and all in need, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Everlasting God, deepen your church's commitment to proclaiming the gospel, that many will hear, respond, and share in its blessings. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, be at our side as we seek a new lead pastor. Give wisdom to leaders of the process, persistence in prayer to all of us as we support the process. Fill us with hope that you will provide a new pastor in your good time. Lord, in your mercy. Everlasting God, rule over the nations and guide their paths toward the fulfillment of your purpose, nurturing the common good, protecting the weak, 
providing justice and caring for the needy. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Strengthen the powerless. Lift up the weary and wounded. Give endurance to those whose struggle is unrelenting. Heal the sick. Relieve the pain of those who suffer. We pray for those who are suffering from illness or injury, including Thora. For those living with long-term illness or cancer, Melissa, Joan, Randy, Robin. Those facing challenges in life, Greg B, Sam. Those in hospice care, Cheryl and Dan. Those who are homebound, Wayne, Ron, Glenn, Jeannie and Daryl, Cliff and Carolyn. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, Hear additional petitions that are on our hearts, spoken now out loud or in silence. Lord, in your mercy. Searching God, expand the welcome and witness of this congregation's outreach ministries. We pray for those served by these ministries and for all visiting with us today, this week, and in the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy. Unsearchable God, you are always more than we can understand or imagine. Guide us to follow in faith where saints have led until we join them at your throne. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Trusting in your love and healing, O God, we commend to you all for whom we pray, knowing you will hear and answer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way also, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me. You may be seated. This morning we'll commune in a continuous style. You'll be directed forward by the ushers. We'll initially uh, commune those who are helping with the service.
as you're able, please stand. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in your faith in him to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that, for mercy, you would strengthen us and pay the for you and perfect love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. seated unless you want to twirl before you do so. That's great. I'm actually going to let you take this first announcement, Pastor. Okay. It's okay. All right. Thank you. Um, as you've noticed, we've shifted a bit the way, the way our prayer form is uh, for prayer requests on Sunday morning. Uh, you may have noticed, if you haven't noticed, please look at the announcements for this week. We're now starting to, to list our prayers in the weekly announcements so that you can be praying for the members of our congregation as well as we go along. Um, a reminder that, oh, there's one here. Yes, there is. There are these lovely little cards in the um, pews that you can fill out uh, if you would like a prayer request, uh, either to be prayed 
or privately or publicly, uh, please make use of those. But we want to involve you more deeply in this part of our prayer life, even as we're trying to involve you more deeply in the prayer life of the congregation on behalf of the transition and call process. So this is sort of, they all work together in a way. Um, prayer is, it was good for Jesus, it's even better for us in a way. It's something that he makes possible. So that's what's going on. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chad Sherman. I'm a director of family ministry here at Lutheran Memorial. We have a lot, a lot of good things going on here. One of which is a new group um, that is going to be lay led uh, by one of our members, uh, Joe Ayers. Joe, would you mind just raising your hand up in the air? That's Joe there. Uh, Joe is, is starting a new group called Day Brighteners, where they are taking a, a, a group of individuals to go visit shut-ins or the elderly. And so if you would like to be part of that group or know more about that group, just talk to Joe or talk to us and we'll get you in contact with Joe. So uh, that'd be great. Uh, free campus meal, February 7th. College students, this is uh, for you at 5 p.m. lasagna. Uh, what a great uh, meal that we have provided, and so we'd love for you to be able to participate in that. Um, also, uh, the Finkies, Greg and Susan Finky, are two individuals that teach others how to be on mission for Jesus. They are coming to the College Bible Study on February 8th, uh, so if there's any college students watching online, we would love for you to participate in that February 8th uh, for the College Bible Study. Um, and then... Pray Local. We have uh, a member from our, our prayer committee that's going to come up and share a little bit with you about all the prayer opportunities that are happening at Luther Memorial for our, our call process. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Stephen Rolf, and um, I just wanted to let you know that a, a prayer group has been uh, put together to help facilitate the uh, process. Um, for the, uh, the call process and cover it in prayer. And uh, I didn't know so much would be talked about today in terms of prayer, but thank you, Pastor, and thank you, Crystal. This is just fantastic. Um, so with that, I have uh, three announcements here. Um, we took a short pause with Pray Local, but we're starting that up. What Pray Local is, is we come into the sanctuary here the first Wednesday of the month at 7 o'clock, and we just pray together, whatever is on our hearts. And we will have some focus around the call process, of course. <clears throat> if you want to come, you don't even need to pray. You can just sit with us, and whoever would like to pray, we pray. Um, the second one is um, we have become aware that many people don't know that we have a prayer chain uh, that is an email prayer chain. So we have... Um, provisions for you to be able to sign up either in the back of the fellowship hall or just go online and it'll direct you to how to sign up for the email prayer chain. And then lastly, um, we have cards uh, printed out that can kind of guide you in the prayer for the call process. Um, Ann Ross has graciously uh, written out something um, and we have those cards that uh, the ushers will hand out to you on the way out to each family unit or each uh, unit person, and um, and you can use it as a guide or put it on your fridge and use it directly. So um, we have the premise that you know the church is advances on its knees, you know, not on its feet in prayer to God. So thank you for keeping all these prayers in your heart. I think that's all from me. <laughs> Go in peace and serve the Lord.